thank you, Skip. <clears throat> and good evening to all of you. It is a great honor to introduce our renowned uh, teacher, social activist, and my fellow countryman, Professor Wale Shoinka, uh, whom I have known since 1976, when we first met him at the University of uh, Ife, now a university called Obafemi Awolowo University. I was just a junior scholar at that time in the Department of Religious Studies, and he was a full professor in literature, drama, and African uh, studies. Even at that time, his list of achievements and distinctions was as impressive as it was long. And because you can read about those in the program you have taken, I will not uh, talk about it. I'm going to focus on a different uh, kinds of thing. Uh, given my personal uh, reflections on the man and the years of friendship that he has developed with quite a number of us, even though we are very, very junior to him in age and even in our scholarship. Chui has been ahead of his time in the courageous championing of the rights of the underprivileged, the silent majority, and his fellow citizens. And in the period of national menace, he has used his pen wisely in a way that evoked respect across the world. Shoenka's moral and intellectual ascendancy are the subject of research in Africa, the Caribbean, Europe, and in America. And indeed, one of the distinguishing traits of Professor Shoenka is his practically total freedom from any kind of fear or inhibition to take personal risk in fighting tyranny, poverty, corruption, and any social or moral ill, audacious enough to challenge his formidable intellect and force of character. I was once warned by my aunt uh, when we were talking about uh, one of the characters that he mentioned yesterday, uh, that I should not talk about that man because she claims that we are also Wu people, uh, even though we lived in Okebo, Dio Fagmo's hometown. And he, like most of us present here, has dedicated not only to give uh, honor to his own country, but he has also, in his own ways, been very critical of that country. Showing Ka's uh, record, I love my country and no go lie, can be considered to be a manifestation of his devout patriotism that he has inherited across uh, the years. There is no doubt that is a true Nigerian. However, his critical engagement has not been limited to Nigeria alone as he has challenged the assumptions of previous Western scholarship of Africa and persuasively introduced new concepts and new tools to debunk centuries of falsehood and lies developed primarily to place the black race intellectually at the lowest end of human evolution. By debarring them, and many of us from taking a rightful place in the profession and in the academy. And listening to Shoinka, as a son of an Anglican priest, and a man, you know, this I'm referring to myself here, I can understand his critical stance on religious fanaticism, particularly as manifested in our own home country, Nigeria. But Shoika harbors a form of an invisible religion that reflects his morals and intellectual status in the world uh, today. An invisible religion that encourages courageous uh, championship of the rights of ordinary people, which guarantees his freedom from fear and inhibition to castigate moral evil in our society. And even though we walk under the shadow of the valley of death, we will not give up on Nigeria, and we kind of take you in. If only for the sake of our children and for the generations yet unborn. Yesterday, we had Shoyinka Ulojais, among others, our mothers, and the twins, Ibeji. I actually felt like dancing earlier on when I listened to the tune. I was expecting them to sing the Ibeji song for me. 
As I happen to be a twin myself, permit me to retaliate in the language of Idi Amin, in praise of our teacher, our mentor, our professor at large, by citing the Oriki of Ogun, his patron deity. Ogun is the forest god. He gives all his clothes to the beggars. He gives one to the woodcock who dies in the indigo. He gives one to the cockerel who dies in the canwood. He gives one to the cattle egret who leaves it white. Ogun's laughter is no joke. His enemies scatter in all directions. The butterflies do not have to see the leopard. As soon as they smell his shit, they scatter in all directions. Master of iron, chief of robbers. You have water, but bathe in blood. The light shining in your face is not easy to behold. Ogun with the bloody cap, let me not see the red of your eye. Ogun is not like pounded yam. Do you think you can nail him in your hand? and eat him until you are satisfied? Not at all. Not with Ogun. Do you think Ogun is something you can throw into your cap and walk away with it? Not at all. Please join me in welcoming Professor Shuinka to this lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, ah. I forgot to give you the names of our performers, Vanessa Lindbergh and Sandy Perez. So give it up for us. OK, can I start now? <laughs> you may. You may. <laughs> Good afternoon. I thought we'd begin, especially after that, just to take your temperature down a little bit, um, just show some of the uh, slides, just uh, a few of them, and maybe make one or two comments, uh, if I think you may have not linked them. They were supposed to have been shown when I was talking yesterday, and I completely forgot that they were there. <laughs> so just show them, one after the other. Uh, skip the ones with, the, um, with those two items we showed uh, already, and um, I'll stop you if I want to make a comment. Otherwise, just show them. Uh, yeah. who's, uh, who's operating the power? Oh, you're not ready. Uh, well, it's me. Okay. Oh, is it? Are you hiding it here again? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, okay. In Yeah, that is uh, an unusual uh, gungu mask because it's uh, metallic. Usually, uh, gungu masks are wooden. But this is one of those exceptions which um, we've seen in, in the streets also. Yeah. Yes. Ah, yes. Um, I could tell you a number of stories about uh, my former student there, who's the curator. Uh, when I was running some classes on aesthetics and the sort of things I got them into, um, I used to send them even onto the rubbish heap to go and pick up anything they thought looked uh, like having any kind of attractive details. Then we'll try and analyze them. He made a very um, uh, close friend of mine, the famous late Femi Johnson, who was a, one of the greatest trencher men in the world. Made him lose his appetite for a few days because I sent the class, I told them to pick up certain structures, any structure they wanted in the city, in the town, and relate them to the environment and write essays on them. And uh, so I picked one or two out, he was among them. He wrote about Femi's new structure in the slums, a new modern glass and steel and glass uh, structure in the middle of the slum. So I gave it to my friend to read. And my friend lost his appetite for a few days. Uh, you have a lot to answer for that. So in return, I was trying to, um, uh, we were just playing around where we were trying to sort some of these things out and we do his own kind of installation. 
uh, what you see there uh, progressively uh, are uh, some of the Onisha, it's called Onishamakat literature, which actually is a cradle of contemporary English literature in Nigeria and parts of West Africa. Uh, even writers like uh, um, Cipriana Quensi, uh, Okara, Chinua Achebe have publications in this market uh, literature. I think we'll probably see one or two of them. And in the middle there, you, the lure of antiquity. Here is a volume of Shakespeare. It's totally deteriorated, but I cannot stop unless it's on a page which has been eaten. I prefer that volume to the most modern volume compilation of Shakespearean plays. It's one of the sicknesses of uh, and those who love antiquities. You can see those little things there. What are you going to read there? But I keep it, I use it anyway. And when I get to, if I need a play, which is been then I go to the other volumes, reluctantly. Yes, go on. Yeah. And that's one I call Old Man Enigma. It's been with me from eternity. And despite all the depredations of dictators who bombed my house and tried to set fire to it and things like that, he has always been there for me. I always find he survives. He's a great survivor. I call him Old Man Enigma. Yes, go on. <laughs> yeah, that was the continue of the process. We had a friend of mine, uh, Tunde Kelani, who helped photograph some of these items. Just asked him to keep taking pictures. Yes, you can see early political literature. <laughs> there. Some of those titles are unbelievable. They are unbelievable. <laughs> yes, go on. That's it, Chino uh, own contribution to Onicha market literature. And of course, Lumumba was a very popular subject for the polemicists at the time. Aha, uh -huh, that's when I began to pose. Um, um, in fact, he's the assistant from that model, the assistant to Tunde Kelani, the photographer. And I brought out one of these family looms. You'll recognize, I think, some of you, some of you, the old ancient gramophone. And uh, so I was posing it against the computer, uh, modern computer, which always gives me problems, uh, punishing the two of them. Uh, yes, go on. And of course, that's a balufon, uh, one of these uh, mythical creatures. And I placed it there to overlook the academic who thinks he knows everything <laughs> and he's got the right thing. Looking at him, say, what do you think you're up to? I own all the secrets. You don't. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's different uh, poses there. Yes? That's the last one. Yes. I just wanted to have a taste of some of the things we get up to when we have nothing better to do. So today, well, we'll just talk a little bit of the triumphal march of the Orisha. And just to remind us, uh, to round off yesterday's uh, charge of uh, the charge sheet of a yet a subsisting, even systematic process of cultural attrition, uh, to ensure that it is clearly understood that we are not speaking of the over-documented centuries of aggression, but in fact of a far more contemporary uh, phenomenon, here is some undisguised triumphalist uh, crowing over a bout of uh, fundamentalism uh, and the rampages in my own nation, one that ends in fact with a further exhortation, incitement to more iconoclastic rampage. That is barely this uh, extract is taken from a publication, Media, Nigeria Media, just two or three uh, years ago. Uh, I think um, I shall change the name of the town which is involved, uh, for, because just to avoid any needless um, you know, umbrage. I think some of us here will still remember the distortion of something which I said right at this very podium, which nearly set off the drums of ethnic war rolling in Nigeria, with us blissfully unaware that any such uh, provocation has been given because none was given and it went on and on and on. So instead of using the name of the town involved here, I shall even use the name of my own town, uh, Ishara. Uh, I'm quite at liberty to malign my own uh, town without anybody taking offense. 
and if they do and decide to uh, disown me, we also have a reputation in my town for parsimonious dealing. And when they think of how much the ritual of renunciation will cost, they will just leave me severely alone. Now, here's the extract. Ishara, again, false attribution, destroys 100 shrines in, uh, to cleanse the land. That's the headline. Here, are just a few excerpts. I quote, Ishara, a community in Ogun State, weekend ended a three-day restoration crusade organized by the United Congress of Ishara Christian Association or something like that, with the destruction of no fewer than 100 shrines all over the area. The crusade, which attracted an unprecedented crowd estimated at more than one and a half million, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, uh, each night was characterized by innumerable signs and wonders as different people were healed of diverse sicknesses ranging from ear problems, I wish I was there, I have that, chest pains, while many others uh, vomited poisons. Their leader is reported uh, to have also said that the movement is intended to achieve, I quote, the total emancipation of Ishara nation, spiritually, economically, and politically. Ishara is to Yoruba land what Yoruba land is to Nigeria. And since Yoruba land was waiting for the restoration of Ishara, the entire country is indirectly waiting for the empowerment and restoration of Ishara land. The following justification is then offered uh, for this meme, uh, a very different tenor. I quote, with the destruction of no fewer than 100 shrines that have hitherto constituted a barrier to the development of the land, it has become obvious that the destiny of Ishara people would soon be changed for better. And finally, we learn that the movement intends to march on very soon, the leader said, the over 1,000 shrines in Ishara would be destroyed completely. 1,000 is threatened. Strong stuff. And if we can, please remember, it's not Ishara we're talking about. You know, and if we can uh, encounter such evangelist uh, fervor in this century from the products of efficient missionary zeal, we can only imagine what has obtained over the past two or three centuries in the land. And perhaps such movements were responsible for what I encountered when I returned from my studies in the UK in 1960. Very likely not, at least not by themselves. They had help from other agents of attrition. The downright straightforward robbery, which we spoke about yesterday, several, in, institutions, buildings, uh, both internal, of course, and external, these robberies. All that really matters are the results, the effect on a people's psyche and world outlook, then the remedial strategies to which the affected resort when they become conscious of a deep loss, a truncation or erosion in their sense of collective identity. Approached holistically, however, the situation is not all bleak. It is a familiar saga of uh, loss and profit, of neglect and affirmation, devaluation and appreciation. Again, one calls to mind the metaphor of the abiku, which I introduced briefly yesterday, the fleshing out of the fortunes of artistic product as sometimes echoed in that cycle of profit and loss. Once again, for the uninitiated, the abiku is the recalcitrant child who dies, is reborn, dies again, but resurrects, maybe not even into the same family, probably altered in temperament and outlook, 
the result of journeys in other realms of consciousness and encounters with denizens of other universes. Recognition of such a recurrent entity when it reappears may come through the eyes of the Babalao, the diviner. He takes one look at the newborn and declares, ah, this is the same child that left so-and-so family a year or so ago. Allied to this, the, that is the recurrent uh, life cycle, is what one might call the practical acceptance of the adult child. That is the child which is born, but considered an adult, an adult born soon after the death of a, another adult, of a genuine adult, but usually, in fact, an elder person. Then that child is called Babatunde or Yatunde, which means the child has returned. From infancy, that child is remarked as different, wise and knowing beyond his or her age, given to enigmatic or simply authoritative pronouncements in and out of issues considered beyond his supposed level of maturity. Out of respect, the child is allowed to sit in the company of adults and will be addressed sometimes as Baba or Ya. We are heirs to a denigrating history. That fact cannot be glossed over. Those who doubt it or feel reluctant to confront the, sequence, the consequences should watch Sembene Usman's Chedo. This, uh, that is Sembene, he was a Muslim, who was responding, however, to his encounter in depth with the career of religious violence, which has been done by his adopted religion to his forebears. On the Christian side, the literature is more than ample. But I find Joyce carries uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, also made into a film, as a specially penetrating testimony. It's a work by a former colonial officer who actually served in my own uh, Nigeria. The subtle workings of the Christian mission towards the same end, written by one of their own, leaves not much else to be added. Whether the lessons of such a savage history are seen, however, to continue a career of further savaging in one's own generation, it's inevitable that one develops a protective and even combative temperament towards those assailed symbols of one's heritage. We know, however, that we are also heirs to more than negative memory. Despite all odds, despite the deep hostility by the zealot in borrowed outfit, exquisite carved headpieces of the Egungun, the ancestral masquerades emerge at festivals, and even out of season, they parade through the streets at some mysterious urgings. The Gelede, the earth cult, and a special preserve of women reign supreme in places like Badagri and other parts and some other parts in Ijabuland. The Agbegiju, secular, basically performance oriented masquerades which uh, include animal masks and their antics, um, whether observed or even concocted, imaginary, relieve the stress and tedium of modern existence. Masks, caryatids, and votives, intermediaries to unseen forces and deities are still ritualistically renewed with increasing skill and uh, innovation and with motifs from contemporary experiences, ritually consecrated season after season, and ancestral presences captured in wood, fabric, and seemingly aloof but with their arresting vitality, inner or gestural dynamism, are still exhumed and paraded in places from childhood. One had feared some of them, as I recounted yesterday uh, in the testimony of uh, my young colleague, uh, Akintilo, and the attitude towards them was both fear and fascination, but definitely fascination with the very forms and shapes that they took. Yes, sadly, 
the open courtyard gallery of, uh, for example, the monarch, my monarch, the Alaki of Abeokuta, is just a share, mere shadow of his former glory. How could it be otherwise? When one has seen the evidence of the attrition, prodigally festooned in muse museums of uh, other lands, uh, stacked from, in some cases, as I saw once, from floor to ceiling, awaiting classification, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, becoming the treasures of other lands, other territories, not to mention the private garden museums of sliced bottom heresies, uh, whose uh, forebears had in fact denuded the treasure houses of other lands. During those uh, critical years of the run-up towards uh, independence, the laws of heritage protection remained uh, too weak or else were so permissive that they amounted to invitation to collusion for illegal exploitation. Inevitably, the casualness of one's relationship to these works changed, became combative, as I said. In my case, I readily admit that I actually came to value them. These physical objects appreciate them as distinct works of art in their own right, mainly thanks to the knowledge that came with maturity. History came with its own lamentation, um, incredulous, that centuries of robbery under force majeure had shifted to embrace the law of cash majeure. It was addition now, provocation. The poetry of lamentation and the polemics of racial pride only go so far, under whatever name, negritude, call it what you want. The different only in form from the shabby substitute usurping the space where once reigned house posts and caryatids of sublime forms and exquisite proportions, stylized or naturalistic. From the innovation of uh, international expositions in the 19th uh, century in Edwardian England, which was taken up by industrialized uh, cities all over the world, even small cities in the European world had built up acquisitions, considerable acquisitions, leading to streams of, uh, of pilgrims coming to see the wonders of Africa, exploiting, of course, the, this uh, opportunity which went with international expositions. It took a while to make the linkage that gave meaning to historic continuity, to read the artistic richness of one part of the world or the other as the obvious side of the impoverishment and degradation of natural uh, traditional palaces and shrines. However, enough of uh, the Jeremiads. It turned out, however, that in that same year of my return, 1960, this also being the year of the independence, not only for Nigeria, but uh, of much of colonized Africa, that this repatriated heritage was not exclusively locked up in the strong rooms of Europe, the museums, and also that they were not necessarily in their original forms. In certain other thriving habitations, they appeared to be alive and well, up and active in the streets, the markets, and homes, we're referring now to the mostly intangible, what is UNESCO terms intangible uh, heritage, the transfers, the lived retentions that crossed the oceans and implanted themselves on foreign soil, the Americas and the Caribbean. We just heard some of that yeah, intangible uh, heritage. And they were not merely to be found in urban and touristic areas, but even in remote villages sometimes inaccessible mountain fastnesses where the offspring of the dispersed assert the primacy of their origin against state hostility, what Abdias de Nascimento denounced as race genocide, but also, ironically, even against other rebel movements that sought to transform society completely, to eradicate the notion of multiple identities, however, 
and substitute, at least in theory, a classless society uncomplicated also by racial identity. I once witnessed this agenda at work in Cuba in the early 60s and uh, early 70s. Cuba soon reversed uh, that tendency. To, to tell the truth, I did not believe it really took hold as a goal of that uh, revolution. I think it was more the familiar machinations among uh, ideological apparatchiks with a textbook approach to the uh, elimination of social contradictions within uh, whose rubric economic marginalization was of course most easily identified with racial groupings. Reduce racial unconsciousness, uh, racial consciousness to the minimum, and the problem evaporated. At least that thus preached the fervent gospelers. In short, ideology versus identity consciousness. I do not believe that it was ever a party policy, but I may be wrong. Other people may like to correct me. However, it was rather strange for me to encounter narratives of that same tendency, or even more recently, in embattled zones like Colombia. Only four or five years ago, I visited uh, a resettlement village in Colombia. It was very far from that postcard, that beautiful postcard uh, city, this micro-sized, very picturesque, uh, unfortunately not collectible, uh, uh, Cartagena. I'm sure many of you here have been there. Um, and this resettlement was just about an hour and a uh, drive of an hour and a half from uh, Cartagena. I met community, community leaders who proudly narrated how finally, how firstly, firstly, they had to stave off the indoctrination pressure of the ideologues of the deadly FARC, FARC, and their brutal intolerance towards identity conscious uh, uh, peoples. Then, when they were transferred to what was called the protective settlements set up by the government, these leaders found that they had to evoke the social values of community management inherited from their African traditions to fight off the drug barons and other criminal cartels who had begun to take hold of their lives all over again, even in the government protected villages. Of course, it is all a mixed uh, uh, record, but for our purposes, it send out, sends out the cheering news that culture, even where its spiritual symbols have long vanished, been destroyed, that culture remains a lived resource, a warehouse of social options, even during the struggle for survival. Oh, did I remember to specify, by the way, their songs, dances, even names that they had retained were all Yoruba. They'd added to their repertoire, for, for example, some Senegalese dances. But when I looked into it, when I asked them, it turned out that they had copied those dances from video uh, recordings, which they had seen on television or, in fact, requested. But the dominant culture throughout was Yoruba. The literature, of course, had been there all along. Nicolas Guillén, Pepe Caril, Abdias de Nocimento, René uh, de Perst, and others. I had yet to encounter any of these <clears throat> stalwarts, but it was in the same year, 1960, that I physically interacted with my first literary emissaries of the Yoruba realm, one of whom was actually also a state envoy. That was Antonio Olinto, accredited to both Nigeria and our neighbor, the Republic of Benin, uh, then known as Daomi. He was a novelist who had uh, traced and narrated the fortunes of a famous Yoruba Brazilian family. His wife, Zora Zelian, was a dramatist, a foraging ground, Yoruba mythology, and the gods. 
Her first play was a, a drama of Yoruba deities, The Trials of Oshala, which she actually brought later to Nigeria. Oshala being, of course, immediately recognizable as the same principal deity of the Yoruba pantheon, Orishanla. Loss and profit, profit and loss. The prodigal son had returned to a home of loss only to encounter on the same soil affirmation of sturdy growth from the ancient seeds of dispersal. So perhaps this rivulet also flowed to swell the subconscious stream of the mandate of restoration through retrieval, however modest. What emerges from such a plethora of impulses, however, is that my attitude in these work, to these works, even where they had never left their homes of origin, has been anything but anthropological. History, yes. Anthropology, out. It is not simply that I found them increasingly compelling and attractive as accomplished works in their own right. They exuded an aura beyond the merely physical. As a child, I suppose the lure of the forbidden also added to that, that sense, that uh, extraction of that era, um, that uh, aura, the lure of the forbidden fruit. Remember, as children, whatever was forbidden became very attractive. <laughs> and so we very well brought up children. We're not supposed to go anywhere near these pagan items, not supposed to touch them, supposed to run away from a gungun. But of course, we took the backyard and went and followed them and got lost in the streets. So no wonder it was uh, quite a deep, euphoric exhalation and sense of vindication, ultimately, that emerged from my throat. At long last, I said, when I visited the Musée de l'Homme at Quai Branly, after that prodigious institution embarked on its new policy of taking African art away from anthropology. That establishment even redesigned a dedicated space for the manifestation of this new direction through the arrangement of the pieces as pieces of art, not as evidence of anthropological certitudes. Comparing my earlier visit to the Musée de l'Homme to that last one at uh, Quiberon Lee was quite uh, a transformation, a revelation. Because I remember the first one very distinctly. It was at the beginning of my first exile, just after the war of Biafran secession. So there, this was a kind of symbolism about my return, a sort of double restoration. At the old Musée de l'Homme, uh, the arts of the continent had been press-ganged by habit into a cohabitation that did not remotely reflect the nature of African creativity, an aesthetic denial that merely entered into the uh, determined agenda of, exclu <clears throat> of exclusion and artistic downgrading. My memoirs, of course, give me away, and uh, no one motivation can claim monopoly of responsibility for this collector condition, not even the last identified candidate, the historic, and the schematic, even scientific, pilferers, Frobenius and company. In a narrative from my memoirs, I admit that even as a student, while attached to the Royal Court Theatre, it's a very interesting well, remarkable, at least, uh, episode in my existence. And uh, so while I was sort of uh, <clears throat> moonlighting from, the, uh, from my studies to the Royal Court Theater in London, I used to stay with a couple, um, uh, were an actor and a painter. Now, my level of uh, art appreciation at the time could never have justified the kind of extravagance into which I plunged when this episode happened. So we can only see if, see if we can fathom what actually happened for me to have got so carried away that I actually bought, bought a canvas, a painting, which I couldn't afford. Now, the painting was by a young British artist named Colin Galland. 
who incidentally <coughs> eventually migrated himself to uh, Jamaica years later and still lives there, for all I know. In that chapter, I narrated how I came upon him painting, putting the fit finishing touches to a strange, almost instantly haunting work. Uh, this was uh, in the year 1959. I remember it because it was the year before I finally reported to myself home. So without a question, this notion, this uh, sort of mood into which I'd entered could have contributed to this uh, moment of Satori. I have no idea. But there it was. I looked at this painting and uh, blinked, double blinked, and I said, Abiku. Yes, it was indeed a strange moment, as str strange as the painting itself, which was unusual, even to the point of being somewhat eerie. Colin, of course, uh, looked at, my, at me puzzled. I explained the meaning of the word and the species of the enfant terrible it represented. Internally, however, I'd already vowed that I would not leave London home without that canvas. Nothing thought out beyond the, uh, the decision, no sense of duty, responsibility involved. I just knew it was something I had to do. It was a canvas I had to have. It had to go home with me. That only left one problem, how to pay for it. I was impecunious, just living on pittance from the Royal Court Theatre, from play reading, one script, and they give you about 10 shillings. It's, I think it was shillings at the time. I knew I couldn't afford it, but I knew I was going to buy it. And so, <clears throat> there it was. Something that worked beyond the authentic charge. Colin Garland, a complete stranger to my world, had touched on something. Call it identification, call it a primordial image transmission from the collective subconscious, but th the point was that he, a white Britisher, had captured an essence that awakened an obscured image and this exiled, impecunious student. In just a flash encounter, I read a bhikkhu, the unending cycle of the child that is born to die, dies to be born again, translated into a new idiom, paint, this deep myth of the Yoruba concept of the cycle of birth and death. It was an ineffable moment of communion across cultures, Little did I know it then, but that canvas had begun to live up to its name. <clears throat> I began saving up, bit by bit, so at least to put down an instance, some, a little sum, wandering, fighting against my normal uh, proclivities, just to save those extra shillings. When next I visited the apartment, his studio, Colin Galland, was already working on another canvas. I no longer remember what it was, mostly because it did not register. My retina was still glued to that, the image of the elusive child. I remarked casually that he was um, a fast worker, uh, then moved into the storage corner to take another look at this uh, seeming message from primordial consciousness. It was missing. So I asked Colin, well, he was keeping the original, the other canvas. That impecunious painter, Colin Garland, kept refreshing his brush on the palette and daubing at the canvas as he offhandedly informed me that, believe it or not, he had wiped off the picture. Oh. Abiku was indeed living up to his name. <laughs> the capricious child of procreation. The Abiku mythology was, however, of no interest to me at that moment. Nor did any thought of self-rebuke for failure to have propitiated issue, the god of disruption, in advance. All that mattered was that Abiku's midwife, a white-faced garret dauber named Colin Galland, had needed a canvas for a new work and could not afford to buy one. So he had wiped off my Abiku and was now using its very swaddling sheets reprimed and stretched for some new rites 
of patrician. Time to bring this narrative to a close. Stunned, I like to believe, by the sudden transformation in a head that now emitted flames and pitch black smoke bursts, Colin retreated, raised his hands in a gesture of peace, took up his paint rag and began to wipe off the strokes which he had begun to implant on that canvas. He commenced, and apparently without too much difficulty, um, an exercise of total recall and began to retrace his uh, infanticidal steps. Later, he felt sufficiently confident to invite me to view it. The concept was mildly different. Uh, there were discernible variations, tonalities, etc. But yes, it was a feat that seemed no less than miraculous. But over the next two days, Abiku actually began to resurface, to emerge. Not long after, it was done. I was able to sigh contentedly, turn my mind to practical issues such as how to pay for it. But yes, indeed, it was definitely a bhikkhu reincarnated. Today, it hangs over my wall in Upland, California, actually looking out towards Mount Baldy, which in turn had been substituting for my Abelkuta home. Abelkuta means under the rocks, under the hanging rocks. A bhikkhu remains the pertinent metaphor for the history of African dispersal, but most especially of the Yoruba. I began with other parameters, all testifying to the human circle, cycle of loss and profit, denial and affirmation, etc., etc. A bhikkhu is central to this experience and perhaps it explains the phenomenon of dispersal for Yoruba slaves transported overseas had built in them that cultural resilience that we call a bhikkhu. This may have died on the black continent, I sometimes wonder. However, that child needed to survive and was made to survive wherever it chose to resurface. So far, so factual. The historic facts are or should be common knowledge. What we hardly, what we've hardly penetrated so far, and through much thinking, though, has been why the exception? What is it? What made the culture not merely resilient, but dynamically so? even to the extent that it fastened on the symbols and mythologies of others. The Roman Catholic, uh, for instance, most notoriously, in order to solidly replant itself in alien lands. Recent statistics, I was confirming this yesterday, or day before yesterday with Skip, appear to indicate that um, there were many more slaves, by far, transported from the Congo than from the land of the Yoruba. Yet these other African transplants generally atrophied and died, but not the Yoruba. It helps to recall, however, or at least to nudge us in a possible, a plausible direction, that even on the land of origin itself, both Christianity and Islam did not remain in the same form in which the intruded and sought to supplant, indeed eradicate, the African cultures. They were both domesticated, transformed, much to their chagrin. But sometimes also are witnessing in some of them fierce movements of recovery of their imagined purity, some in more brutal forms than others, especially when they were overtaken by these periodic spasms of uh, religious cleansing, such as we've seen in the aforementioned Boko Haram, another homicidal strains of any faith. The Yoruba welcomed both Christianity and Islam, millions converted, but few fully, fully repudiated the penetrating gamut of their precedent acculturation. A case very simply of, you can take the Yoruba out of Yoruba land, but you cannot take the Yoruba out of him. 
No, not for a moment does one claim that this is unique to the Yoruba. It is, however, robustly observable and even demonstrable in many instances. Wherever the Orisha have trodden, the cultural retentions from centuries are ever discernible in powerful attestations, from cuisine to the visual, the performance arts, the rhythms, even the melodies, the chanting and literature, especially drama. But most inspirationally in the ecumenism of its spirituality. Scholars of global stature, such as Pierre Verger, have documented and, uh, and publicized areas of these retentions. Writers and artists like Antonio Linto have mentioned have enriched this knowledge, while others, like my uh, late elder brother, Abdias Nascimento, deployed, deployed a variety of creative and polemical strategies to push the authentic black, African, and especially Yoruba cultures in the in recalcitrant faces of Brazilian society, tutoring a rash racist government at one stage steeped in denial on the multi-tributary culture that became recognized eventually as uniquely Brazilian. All these aspects must be presumed to form the dynamic backcloth to the specific narrative of the Orisha. All religions are unique, of course, in some way or the other. If they were not, there would be no religious wars. So perhaps this is one of those instances where variety is not so much the spice of life as the spice of strife. <laughs> However, this uh, ancient religion confidently guides us into a different order of faith and spirituality, proposes that religion need not be a tool of suppression and cruelty. Its very nature protects it from the bellicose instinct that leads followers of a number of other belief systems to defend even the most trivial adaptation of doctrine, doctrinal texts with their lives, or more accurately, with the lives of others. Those others being conveniently designated infidels, unbelievers, apostates, enemies of God, and other charitable epithets. We shall let this religion demonstrate that, perhaps, since religion is so evidently deeply entrenched in the human psyche, humanity is better served in the adoption of secularized deities than by those other gods of uh, revolutionary rigidities and alien habitations, deities that are mythologized into becoming suffocating forces over phenomena and humanity, but merely serve as surrogates for the tyranny of mortals no different from ourselves. The essential virtue that is attributable, uh, attributable to our example, let's again meet once again, is the Orisha religion, practiced by people we all know as the Yoruba, now indigenous of uh, repressive swathes of the Americas and the Caribbean, but originating from west coast of Africa. That special virtue is found essentially in the comparative marginalization of priesthood in its accustomed intermediary role. I don't say removal, exclusion, no, but considerable reduction in its intermediary, in the intermediary path of priesthood. This role in many other um, so-called world religions tends to sanctify the priesthood as a class apart, encourages a monopoly of access to the experience of Godhead, turning a select group into sanctified recipients, exclusive custodians, disseminators, and interpreters of revelation. Not so the Orisha. The Orisha, the followers, are nearly equal participants. The priesthood in other religions pronounce and humanity submit. Very little participation. 
from what should be a purely spiritual function, it's only a short step into secular control. Control over habits, tastes, even personal relationships, indeed all aspects of secular life which properly belongs to other agencies of community and society. With that uh, submission to pragmatism, that is the pragmatic acceptance of the fact that religion seems to be something humanity uh, cannot do without, so bowing to this uh, inevitable, making use of what exists and appears to have existed since the most rudimentary stage of evolution of human society itself, we can extract what we need from the world of one of these homeopathic structures, because that is what I consider it. Urisha worship is a homeopathic structure. This also offers us a convenient point and uh, a useful background uh, to our excursion into that world to try and obtain a general agreement on what we call religion, some form of common denomination. It's a necessary exercise since it anticipates the familiar ploy of uh, denigration that was so beloved by Christian missionaries uh, in uh, soon to be colonized regions of Africa and Asia. For these Bible warriors, African spiritual observances could not be accounted religions, but fetish worship, superstitions, heathenism, cultic or satanic manifestations. Cults, usually of power services that preyed on the superstitious side of man through secret rituals, oath-taking, and thus fear of the vengeance of malevolent forces on apostates and oath-breakers, were conveniently grouped together by missionaries as religions, whereas they were, if anything, purely political instruments of power and terror. Cults were and are still used to acquire wealth, consolidate political pos positions, and keep other sections of the community, mostly often the female sex, in their place. Now that the women in African, uh, in Orisha, uh, do not have their own powerful uh, cults of their own, such as the famous Yami Oshoronga uh, cult of former Daomi and uh, now Republic of Benin, and of course the Gelede of uh, Western Nigeria. Also, under foreign occupation, the rise of cultism is a common enough phenomenon, an adopted instrument of secrecy and solidarity in liberation struggles. Cults may attach themselves to religion in order to harvest a ready membership and ride on religious passion, but cults do not require a deity. Religions are built on the evocation of deities. A religion without a god or celebration of, a, uh, of its essence is simply not a religion. It was however convenient for the missionary to bury religion under a sweeping cultic apprehension, thus conveniently demonizing and or dismissing the existence of that religion itself. Let us quickly make a special mention at this point of a pertinent example of such demonization, this time in the literal sense. When the missionaries arrived in the uh, land of the Yoruba, the home of the Orisha, and commenced their task of conversion they needed the devil. They were handicapped by not having a devil. And so they looked around all the deities, looked at Eshu, mischievous, very mischievous, rascally, the spirit of uh, disruption, the, of uncertainty, and said, ah, that's our devil. And that's how Eshu became the devil. They looked at him, looked at his worship, Notice that the Yoruba, because of his disruptive nature, always places shrine outside the door. You don't allow issue into your house. It's trouble. And you evoke him before you undertake anything because that rascal will mess you up. <laughs> that doesn't mean he's the devil. He's just an overgrown child, a messenger, a gatekeeper, who, however, exercise certain powers and bring even greater gods very often under 
his submission. That sense of balance is what is so marvelous, I think, about uh, the, uh, the Yoruba religion. But of course, issue was perfect. It was tailor-made for the missionary. And so in most of the hymnal companions, in the liturgies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, Eshu is always, the devil, demon, Satan is always translated as Eshu. Never was any mortal or immortal so maligned uh, in the entire history of the pantheons of the world. So the scriptures of the Orisha, however, counter and totally neglect, uh, negate this uh, this, uh, this, this malformation of a character. Eshu is the acknowledged gatekeeper, as I said, of, this, of the warehouse of Ifa. He's the gatekeeper to it. People, some people go so far as to say he decodes Ifa. I happen to disagree. They are here. They will disagree with me later on. You know. <laughs> but he is the gatekeeper. There's no question of that. And if you look at the, bowl, uh, the Ifa bowl, the divination bowl, you see a figure ahead at the top. Now, again, Again, there's a controversy over that because if you ask the authentic Ifa priests in Yoruba land, they will say, let, let you know that this is Uju Ifa, Uju Ifa, the eye of Ifa, but it has been conflated with the issue because he's a gatekeeper. But we, the knowing, we know that it's Uju Ifa, it's not <laughs> issue. <either. laughs> so let's, let me just wind up quickly, uh, and so on, so many other, uh, other aspects of distortion, demonization. But ultimately, it is important that we recognize that the Yoruba religion is not being placed in a kind of unique, unassailable uh, position. It'll be silly to do that, and submitting once again, joining what I call the dogmatic uh, brigade. Issue, however, the Orisha, however, form part and parcel of the mainstream towards universal knowledge of civilization and civilization. And what we're looking at, what we're seeking, I think both those who seek uh, the answer in culture and those who seek it in religion, I think what everybody is looking for is simply human enlightenment. To be able to say confidently, like Tierno Boca, uh, Bokar of Mali, known as the sage of Bandiagara, that yes, there is my truth, there is your truth, and there is the truth. And once this knowledge, this, this wisdom is accepted, then it doesn't matter what we're talking about, Confucianism, uh, Confucianism or Zoroastrism, or Buddhism, or we're talking about the Indian god Ganesh, or Shiva, or whatever. Once, and this is what Orisha preaches, once you accept that there is the truth, your truth is my truth, and there is also the truth. And we can all look for the truth together without demonizing and relegating one. Not only the religion, but the culture that embraces it and which it represents without relegating it to the dustbin. We may speak of the robbers, the negative revisionists, the deluded uh, convertites pressed into service in a career of self-immolation and cultural suicide. But as long as even one Santeria or Candomble remains and is placed at the service of its adoptive community, even as a reference point or warrant for options, humanity remains enlarged and its totality benefits. The critics the critical word, as I said earlier, is simply human enlightenment. And this, in summation, is the unforeseen and yet to be fully harmonized uh, recompense of the transplantation of that mystery breed of Abiku, the Yoruba. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wally. Thank you very much. Would you uh, entertain a few questions? Yes. You want to stand there? Okay. Questions? Matt will hand you the uh, microphone. Is 
Is it on? Yes. yes. I was hoping you would touch on this so I wouldn't have to ask the question. I may be coming from a women's liberation dogmatic place, but could you contextualize clearectomy in the practice of Yoruba, ancient and modern? Could I contextualize? Clitoridectomy. Hmm? Yeah, right. I didn't quite catch, catch the question. Could I contextualize what? Mutilation of the female organ. We call it clitorectomy. Well, my work. No, in no. In Yoruba practice. I, I'm coming from someone who told me it is so integral to Yoruba practice that I could never possibly understand the reasons for it still being practiced. And, and that must be true, but I wondered if you had something to say about it. Yeah. David, come here, come here, come here, David, come and tell me. Sorry, I, I wear ear, ear, earrings and female sometimes this sound Wally. bounces. Wally. I, I think she's talking about female, female circumcision. What they call FGM, female genital mutilation or female genital circumcision, which is not particular to the Yoruba culture. So, mm. Which is not Yoruba culture? Yeah. She was asking that. Uh, Female genital mutilation. Oh, genital mutilation, yes. that's the word I missed. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, the Yoruba and Urisha does not practice, the followers of Urisha do not practice genital mutilation. It happens in other parts of Nigeria uh, and it's constantly being fought uh, by you know, other people, but the Yoruba do not practice mut um, female uh, uh, mutilation. No, they do not. Yeah. They do some other things I don't approve of, by the way. They, they still, in some areas, they still use, uh, they still scarify uh, uh, people, both men and women, you know, it's traditionally, and, uh, but it's not something which I support. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, microphone. <laughs> The child. Oh, the Abiko child. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, not just the Yoruba, uh, in fact, but the Igbo. Uh, and with the, but by the time they do that, what they do to the living child is very different. It's no different from scarification. I underwent that. I am not an Abiko, but my grandfather put me through that torture. <laughs> put me through that torture as a child. I describe it in, as, uh, as you know. And the, it's supposed to be inoculation against their going. You don't want the child to go. So it's a kind of medical fortification with uh, incantations and rituals to earth uh, the child. The Igbo, when the child is dead, they then mark the child, they scar the child, and uh, uh, so that when the child comes again, they will recognize uh, recognize it. And sometimes, I think they also brutalize the child so that the child makes up, is supposed to make up his mind. Either you stay over there so you don't trouble us, or you stay over here. When you, after you're dead and you realize how you were treated, you will decide one way or the other. It's supposed to be <laughs> preventive, but they don't touch the child, either, not to my knowledge. Other questions? Don't be shy. Yes. Nice to meet you, uh, Professor Shoika. Um, my question is: So, what eventually happened to Ishara after the shrines were destroyed? After the three days of destruction. The what? Three days of destruction of those shrines in yes, Ishara. Yes. Yes. So, what actually happened after that? Well, uh, well, as I told you, I didn't want to mention where <laughs> it was taking place, but I wrote article to challenge. Uh, this and in fact this was again misunderstood because I remember a colleague of mine who thought I was talking about some really evil shrines like Okija and I was asking the question you say you're destroying these shrines have you sent in anybody from the Museum of Antiquities to at least take a look at what is in there you just go in there you haven't even been in there you don't know what practices you just decide that it's non-Christian and therefore it's a, it's a heathen and something. And it went all out. It happened not only in that area, it's happened in Ilorin also, years, years, years ago. 
it happens sometimes, even in proper Yoruba land, where some of these born agains, you know, go around and then just destroy anything. Unfortunately, they don't even get the real evil shrines. Look at what's been happening with Beidou in uh, Ikorudu. as a real evil, connected with no religion whatsoever. Just get up in the middle of the night with a pestle, and you believe that by smashing a head and soaking your handkerchief in blood, you become a millionaire. Ah, we know how to become millionaires in Nigeria. <laughs> You're the Minister of Petroleum for one day, and, and you don't need to sure. go and smash people's heads. Yeah, Matt. Yep, no, wait to the microphone. You must be patient. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, just in the spirits of the earlier questions that were raised here, uh, would you like to comment on the OSU uh, system and, and OSU. its kind of correlations uh, mm -hmm. in our imagination? OSU is dying out. Again, this was uh, this notorious uh, knowledge. This was uh, one of the um, cultures in Igbo land in which a certain sect of people within the, the, the tribe uh, were designated also like the untouchables in India. And they used to perform all the menial jobs. And uh, no self-respecting Igbo at the time would marry into an Usu family. He would be disowned. But I think that's virtually expired. I haven't heard any such clash. You know, I think it formed the theme of one of Chino Achebe's uh, 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 plays. Yeah. But uh, uh, plays, uh, uh, novels. But I, I don't. I think it's it's, it's really. I, I know people who married into Su family and so on. And so, so it's it's not it's not current, you know. But obviously there will be some retention somewhere, you know. But it's not general. Hmm. Yes. Hello, Prof. Is it on? Is it on? Yes. Yes. Um, you had mentioned the uh, identification of issue as the devil. And I had read somewhere that um, when the Bible was translated to Yoruba by uh, Samuel Ajay Crowther, was he the one that was responsible for that identification? I didn't quite get that. Yeah, he's asking if uh, Samuel Ajay Crowther's translation no, of the Bible, Bible yeah. was where um, issue was assigned that. Oh, no, no, it wasn't, no, uh, poor Crowther, I knew very well. Um, <laughs> no, I, uh, well, he, he may have participated in it, but even before Crowther, you know, there was already a translation of him, the hymnal companion, for instance, had already been taking place, and many tracts, and so on. So, uh, and of course, uh, he was a deep-dyed uh, Christian. I mean, they did a number on him. There's no question at all. Uh, he, he kept apologizing very much like uh, uh, Phyllis Whitley at one stage of her, you know, in which she was so thankful that the Christian world rescued her, but her little poetry hmm, was a different matter. And uh, yeah, uh, Crowther, I don't think Crowther ever trans transcended that phase, but many immediate uh, converts tend to go in that direction. It's only those you know, with stubborn heads like me, you know, you can't get, you can't get through to, to uh, I defected a long time ago. <laughs> yes, uh, my question has to do with, uh, you talk about um, despite the demonization and um, um, maligning of African religions, somehow they still persist in some form, as you said, most Africans call themselves Christians, but they're not really 100%. They always have something on the side that they attach to Christianity. And I see it sometimes in parts of other parts of Africa, I'm from Kenya, and some, some sects actually call themselves mm -hmm. Christian, but their style of worship borrows heavily still from traditional religions. Mm -hmm. My question is whether um, the Yoruba practice, the religion is somehow been adopted and maybe infused with Christianity or Islam as practiced today mm -hmm. in that persistence of African strain of religious mm -hmm. and worship style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it can, as, I hope that if it's adopted anywhere, uh, it doesn't become structured. And I've seen 
efforts like that in which there was absolutely no difference but just a change of names here and there. And for me, that's not a real you know, uh, trans, uh, translation of uh, one religion into uh, another uh, culture. But one thing is certain, that if you go into, and maybe I'm sure you have, uh, a Pentecostal church, it's a very different atmosphere. The worship, you wonder whether it's the same God as the Anglicans do. You know? <laughs> and even the politics of the Pentecostal churches in uh, Nigeria, along the West Coast, for instance, uh, can be just literally non uh, separable from the politics of the Christian church. But I was actually fascinated by the Pentecostal churches in, uh, in my childhood. And the interpreters, I don't know if you read the interpreters, you see that actually devote quite a bit of time. I was fascinated by what the churches had begun. Of course, there are charlatans everywhere. But the authentic stuff, which I used to go and watch again, I wasn't supposed to because it was too close to, uh, to pagan practices, to Orisha worship, but I did watch. And I rather liked them. They were, they were fun. They were, they were both, not just the drumming, but the kind of camaraderie which existed in, within the community, which is very, very interesting. Yes. yes. Uh, okay. uh, good afternoon, Professor. Do you know the origin of the Ayo Festival in Lagos? Ayo? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the, there's a dispute over that, and I have a feeling that you're asking deliberately to see which side I'm on. <laughs> 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 Some people actually say that the Ayo came from Ijebu, uh, the uh, Ayo, well, it's so deeply entrenched in Lagos with the various families, you know, with their own tradition of Ayo, that it's difficult to take it away from Lagos. And I think what we decided in Ijebu is they don't have too much culture in Lagos, let them have Ayo. You know, <laughs> we surrender it to them, you know, so we, we won't fight them. It's, Ayo is Lagos, and we leave it at that. <laughs> yes. Yes, I have a question from yesterday um, dealing with um, the destruction of African artifacts. How do you feel about, for future scholars, uh, I was reading someone in UNESCO, they were worried about ISIS, the Taliban, and I don't know about Boko Haram, but how do you feel about scholars trying to reconstruct history or African American studies and they have to deal with, you know, the destruction of important African artifacts? How, how do you feel about that? I and mean, wh what do you think should be the role of the scholar in trying to, mm -hmm. so you know, you go forward? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you just repeat the last part? Um, what for an African for an African American studies scholar or a historian who has to deal with the destruction of uh, African artifacts by maybe you know somebody like a group like ISIS or the Taliban or maybe Boko Haram? How? How should they go forward in trying to do research? I mean, what, what do you think, you should, what advice should you give for scholars trying to, uh, to move forward in doing research if they go to Africa and trying to do field research? Mm -hmm. In, in view of the destructions mm -hmm. by, say, Boko Haram or other, mm -hmm. even the Christians, of mm -hmm. indigenous uh, mm -hmm. uh, art forms and artifacts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, to do research. Yeah, right. yeah, the, from an African American perspective, when you mm -hmm. want to research these materials ah. and they're taken away, what, what uh, do you oh, feel? Oh, okay. Yeah. For a moment, I thought you said research Boko Haram. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Only one way to research Boko Haram. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, it's not all gone. That's definitely. And the dedication of people I mentioned yesterday, like. Um, Remy Shillon, for instance, who's, who does a lot of work on not just uh, recovery, restoration, but even commissions, copies, so that they can be used for those who, for instance, are interested basically in, the, in artistic styles uh, and the history of certain trends of artistic production, so they can actually see replicas of what uh, they're working on. And the Nigerian Museum hadn't done too bad, but there has been such robbery, you cannot imagine it. I have been involved in trying to 
track down some of these, and I'm not talking about the, that episode. I'm talking about even being, uh, uh, for instance, there was one huge case in Amsterdam when there was a real line of repatriation from the National Museum through one of the senior workers there, and the market was Amsterdam. And then there's a huge market also. Again, this way must give the devil uh, a due, uh, which was in fact tracked to Chinese mass production. And I worked with some, um, uh, with a curator for some time in Cape Brown Lee, because suddenly they got a hint of a certain production line of fakes, the fake industry in, uh, in, um, uh, um, in China. And my attitude was, well, when you discover it, for heaven's sake, don't destroy it. Just mark it and let it be available. When you seize it, just let it be available to students. To all that. Say, this is a, a replica, and you can study what you want from it. You can adopt the method of the Carlos Library in, um, in uh, Emory University, for instance. They returned all the original artifacts, whether to Greece or to Africa or whatever, but they made very authentic looking replica, which now are in the library, uh, in, the, in the museum, Carlos Museum, and people, students can go there and do research. Mm -hmm. Books, sketches also, <coughs> those are available. Um, uh, Frobenius, that mass robber, uh, mm -hmm. did a lot of sketches, did measurements, he went with his assistants, with even weighing machines. Uh, balances just to record uh, details and so on. There's lots, loads of material, thank goodness. And I, I don't get unduly excited about the repatriation of authentic material, for instance. The important thing for me is to know where they are. And eventually, eventually to bring the uh, the illegal uh, collection depot all over the world to the table so we can discuss what we will give in return. Because it's very difficult, really, to snatch these things back. Uh, many people will bring out uh, deeds of sale. Uh, they will quote history and uh, do the accounting of how much it took to subdue Benin and to say that they had to defray their cost by uh, stealing uh, all these <laughs> items. But if we sit down, we can say that, look, uh, go back to the whole theme of reparations and say, look, why don't we forgive everything, but you return everything? It's one formula <laughs> which I proposed, but nobody ever listens to me. <laughs> <laughs> we have time just for two more quick questions. The mic, sir. You and then you. You uh, first. Professor Shurga, uh, thank you for the presentation. I. Uh, I have a question about uh, some of the elements that you uh, raised in uh, the fourth stage, particularly concerning uh, uh, Yoruba tragic arts. And uh, my question has to do with uh, uh, what do you envision to be uh, the future of uh, an artistic production that is uh, partly ordained in the sense that uh, the the performance that you describe in the in uh, in the fourth stage, uh, the actor is f for him to uh, sort of uh, cross that bridge between uh, physical and metaphysical space. That's uh, that's a function of uh, being ordainedly sort of ordained to do that particular part. Now, if we're looking at uh, the future of these uh, performances. I mean, what do you envision to be the future of uh, these arts which are, are both physical and metaphysical at the same time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, to say what's the future of anything is a kind of question I tend to run away from uh, because this is very much in the hands of the producers themselves. And artistic fashion changes so rapidly is uh, affected by trends even outside one's immediate community. And uh, schools evolve uh, despite uh, categorizations of uh, critics and art historians. Schools have a way of evolving. 
utilizing certain, uh, uh, certain devices from within their own culture or responding to some earth-shaking event which has created a cataclysm within society. One obvious example is the Uli School of Artists from Eastern Nigeria, uh, in which, recovering from a traumatizing war, the artists came together to look for new symbols of restoration, psychic restoration, etc. You know, Uchu Keke, Anubarapaya, etc. Even El Anatsui, who is not a, uh, an Igbo, but comes from Ghana. But that school, that school just evolved, and it was known as the Uli School. And this goes on all the time. People withdraw, they will draw from their own society the kind of symbols, material, where they need. So the future, uh, for me, in fact, is very pleasant because it's unpredictable. You know, it's very promising. <laughs> Great, final question. Okay, I've got two questions, and I'm going to be very quick. Um, so sometime this year, Damien Hirst was accused of um, cultural appropriation in his exhibition. And it was said that he... Um, appropriated what is believed to have been similar to the um, Ife heads. Now, you said very recently, uh, quickly now, that you're not excited about rep um, repatriations. Um, and you said that you would like this, you know, artifacts to be brought to the table. And I wonder to what extent that you believe that this is possible, considering that there is uh, little investment in... Um, I guess the storage facilities and ensuring that these artifacts are brought and then sustained. That's the first question. The second question is, you talked about the fact that Yoruba religion is not exceptional or that there's not, nothing exceptional about, about it. Um, but then you referenced the fact that, you know, there are vestiges of the tradition that have remained in, as you say, uh, the offsprings of those that have been dispersed. I guess what I'm trying to ask is, what then makes it not exceptional, despite this. It's good, good, good. I missed the first one especially. The first question is about uh, Damien Hurst, the British uh, artist who reproduced the Ife head, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and the controversies around that, mm -hmm. because it's not a repatriation, it's just remaking of mm -hmm. that, um, using Leo Frobenius' text mm -hmm. to do that. So she was asking what your opinions were about yeah. that. About the reproduction, artists yeah. who reproduce? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the second question had to do with um, the Yoruba um, retentions. Mm -hmm. And um, on one hand, you did say it's not unique mm -hmm. um, yeah. and exceptional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it, there are evidences that they are unique and exceptional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with the culture being both unique and uh, also exhibiting at the same time shared. Uh, peculiarities in one or two directions. There's absolutely not, no, no contradiction. Uh, one tries to be very objective, and uh, we know that many conquered societies uh, where the cultures have been ruthlessly, seemingly eradicated, uh, um, somehow they managed to keep to retain, it's very difficult to take the culture out of people. One notorious example, look at the communist period in Soviet Union, where you even dared not mention uh, religion. There's only one religion, and that was Joseph Stalin during that particular period. And what happened when uh, Perestroika uh, took over, after decades of denying uh, the existence of religion. All they did was just uh, open the doors of the cathedrals, take out the vestments, dust, send them to the dry cleaners, and it was like business as usual. That's true. It, it was always there, the un, under, undertow, the stream is always there. You can never take, so that's why I say, I, I don't want to give Yoruba the unique capability of resilience, retention, despite all the pressure. There are many examples, but in certain other uh, aspects, the Orisha worship, and I've mentioned one before, maybe not yesterday, maybe somewhere else, that the Orisha, for instance, is one religion, unlike a number of religions you can think of, which come, which go beyond their borders, the Orisha has never fought a war on its own behalf. There's never been any war of proselytization, evangelization, is just content to be and accept 
the existence of other religions, you know, are simply roots to the manifestation of Godhead. So you can have both unique and shared characteristics. It's nothing abnormal about that. And the first one, I've forgotten. Uh, Damien has uh, the, the artist, the British artist, who reproduced the Ife head. The Ife head. head. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. With the uh, issue of the Ife head. You know, there's always been, again, reproduction. You see, any reproduction, there's nothing wrong with that. In literature, there's imitation. And of course, there's plagiarism. But there's the kind of imitation which flatters, excuse me, <clears throat> which in fact flatters the original. But you mustn't pretend that that is the um, um, original. And um, to, to make 20 copies of, uh, uh, of an object and lie that you only made four, you know, that is what is known, that's criminal. And uh, I think artists and those who are original creators have a right to look at scans, as scans, uh, at, uh, as that kind of conduct. We are constantly being plagiarized writers in Nigeria, even to the extent of warfare. We've broken up a number of, uh, of pirates, of books in, uh, in Nigeria. It continues all the time. There was a nest broken up in uh, Benin not so long ago, and it was a violent affair. My death and the king's horseman, I saw it. They didn't even have the decency to spell my name right. <laughs> it was W-H-O-L-E. I mean, if you're going to plagiarize, at least do a proper job, you know, so I can be <laughs> proud of you and say, this is a, a fake original, you know. And, and, uh, but very often, it's, they're so eager to make masses of uh, copies and send them to the market so that schools will adopt them, and we don't even get any oh royalty on top of being abused like that. Very nasty. Before we thank Professor Shoyuka, I just want to remind you, we're having our reception over at the Hutchins Center on 3R at the Rudenstein Gallery, where we're going to open the exhibition of Lynn Davis's marvelous photographs of Africa. 104 Mount Auburn Street. Please join us for food and drink, but not before we give it up for my dear friend, Wally Singh. <laughs>